1864. Um, but why do I care about that? I want to know how that context makes a difference. So that's another advantage of beginning with the local, is that it already makes a difference. Do you see? Then your students can expand from that local to the more global. Context makes a difference. Wow. Now, when you tell me about Hawthorne was the grandchild of a hanging judge who sentenced some of the Salem witches to death, now that makes a difference to me because I know the context tells me something about the world I care about. So you extend it by moving from the local to the other text you want to read. I would, if we had um, time, I was going to show you more of these early pictures so that you yourself, if we had time, we'd just like talk about what kind of assignment might grow out of that? Where, what, where could we take that? How could they write about it? I would start myself with asking my students, I have this, mo this recent picture, I would ask them to just write a description of what they see. Observation is deeply a part of inquiry. We don't spend enough time, <coughs> any of us, helping students observe, except people who are teaching biology. <laughs> That's the thing you have to do, right? As a biologist, you have to really know how to look and look again. But in English, we're more like what I think, what I feel. But we've got to start with inquiry. We've got to start with what we see. What we see, of course, is based on who we are, what we've seen before, what we expect to see, right? And we learn all of that by looking at, um, looking at something hard. If you're interested in practicing that thing of observation, I recommend to you a wonderful little essay called um, In the Laboratory with Agassiz, A-G-A-S-S-I-Z, -S um, written by a guy named, Ken, and it was in uh, maybe 1890 or something, um, his name was Samuel Scott. And he writes this thing about how, you know, Louis Agassiz was a famous paleontologist, they were out west, that he found this archaeological specimen of an ancient fish. He brought it to Agassiz and said, whoa, look, this is great. And uh, Agassiz says, go back and look at it again. He does this like for two weeks and he's writing about it and he can't, until he can't like, he's like, what else is there in this fish? I have written a part of can't see another thing. And finally he goes and Agassiz says, okay, now you're ready to look. This laborious looking is really, I think, important. So I would begin by asking students to see, to just write what they see. I do an observation exercise with my students often where I give them a natural object. This comes from Ann Bertov, um, who is my mentor and hero of the world. And she handed out, you know, pieces of wood or uh, shells or you know, dandelion, I don't even know, all kinds of things. And I give those things out to my students. They have to keep them with them for a week. <laughs> they write uh, every two or three days, or sometimes more often, we have a sort of thing where they write about what they see, and then they, in a double entry format, this is from Amberto, they write what that reveals about when they look at what they've written and what they're actually seeing, they talk about why they've chosen that to write, or they just reflect on what they've written. After about a week, of course, some of them are just, they just cannot bear to stand looking at their thing again. Just, I think, part of the point. Some of my students, when they, I gave one of them, I remember this so well, I gave a shell. Maybe I gave all shells that semester. So I had this little, she had this little shell. And you know, you're supposed to like look, way, you know, all the kind of real observation. So she had this shell and she said, here's my shell. It's pink on the outside and white in the middle. I think I'll call her Joanne. <laughs> she spent the whole rest of the time, just like Joanne went with me out on my day last <laughs> night. <laughs> um, well, I put Joanne on the windowsill. She didn't like it. I mean, it's like, no, wait a minute. So it was like completely that idea of, that we do, English majors do so often, let it, let's like not look, not look this way, but react that way. So part of the whole idea of inquiry and description and being curious has to do with how we look at something and then how we use that looking to tell us to tell us more. Okay, so that's that's context. The second um, 
thing, and I, I think it, it relates uh, to context and certainly relates to, um, and certainly relates to how we teach inquiry, is to teach audience. Um, if I were to use my pictures um, of the Faust building, Old Main, and I was going to have students do inquiry about it, what happened to it, what kind of architecture, what, whatever, I would create, help them at, generate all those questions, and then I would have them pursue the answers to those questions in their small groups. Now, why would I do that? Because I believe that people learn more in a social setting than they do individually. I believe that the ideas they can generate are bigger and more interesting if they listen to other people, if they learn how to articulate what they think against what other people think. So I might create a whole project where my students are working together to come up with some kinds of decisions about what they're, what they're looking at and what it means. You might say, what does that have to do with audience? But it has everything to do with audience. We teach sometimes audience as, say you're talking to a group of librarians, or say you're talking to some second graders. Well, that's one way to do it, but it's sort of fakey. <coughs> Because the, your student is saying, I never would talk to a group of librarians. <laughs> or, you know, I don't like seven-year-olds or something, you know. <laughs> so it, it's not, it, you know what I mean? I mean, it, it's good because it <coughs> makes them have to change things up. But the better thing is to take advantage of what you've got right in your classroom. They talk to each other. They're one another's audience. And let it be in a little group first, not the big group. Because remember number two about being anxious? My students, when they come to me being anxious, one way to get over that anxiety is to have them working in small groups first. All of us have seen, and all of us are, who are students know this, that a lot of people are much more at ease if they can talk in a little group rather than in the big group. Or certainly if I make them stand up in front of the big group. I'm going to suggest that students do that too. But if they have, finally when they get up and talk in front of the big group, here's what we think about Old Main at UNCG. Here's why we think that this kind of architecture was used. Here's what my group said. They are speaking to the group at large, but they also know that their little group, the bluebirds over there, they've got their back. They've got their back. I know that they've been in on this with me. So I've got somebody. It's a way of developing skill and confidence, a way of seeing the difference in audience. Do you see that? To talk in a little group and to share ideas, then to come up and talk in the big group, that's a change in audience, as well as a change in context. Practice with that. Practice that idea that who you are, what you have to say, depends in great measure on who you're saying it to, for what purpose? Time changes, time changes, vocabulary changes, how much you smile. Everything changes depending on who you're talking to. Get your students in the habit, not just of seeing the audiences, the multiple audiences that are in your classroom, but of watching.